we are at the penultimate issue of Nintendo Power's eighth year for April of 1996. We have featured preview coverage, but not strategy guides, for our first big third-party N64 game, and a lot of revisiting titles for the Super Nintendo, so kind of a lean issue this time. So let's get started. Our cover game for this issue is Earthworm Jim 2, with more coverage of that game, which I've already reviewed. In the letters column, we have some reactions to the layout changes with some mixed responses. It's nice to see I'm not the only person who misses the old layout for classified information. No new titles in the power charts this issue, as kind of everything Nintendo is in a holding pattern while we wait for the N64 to come out. We have a preview article for Shadows of the Empire with general notes on gameplay. Going from the article, both writing and screenshots, it looks like the vehicle sequences are currently in their final form at this point, while the character levels still appear to be a work in progress. They've got something of a hybrid between a third-person and first-person perspective for the camera, where it's by default when it's facing forward is in a first is in a first-person perspective, and then when you shift the camera viewpoint, then it will goes into a third person. I'm not sure how it's supposed to work in practice. That probably also explains why they got rid of it, because I don't believe the final game works that way. Now, our first game of this issue is Power Pigs of the Dark Age, a platformer from Titus. The art makes it look like this game was based on some sort of short-lived animated series or direct-to-video animated film, um, like all the numerous shows made to cash in on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. However, I can't find any information on such a work existing. If you do have any information on whether such a thing exists, whether in the U.S. or France, please let me know in the comments. In any case, we get maps and notes for several levels. Power Pigs of the Dark Age isn't a bad game, it's just mediocre. It has a very minimal amount of character to it, not helped by the fact that while the title screen features three characters, the titular power pigs, plural, in single player you can only play as one and you can't choose, choose which one that is. In all seriousness, this game feels like it would benefit from some cutscenes just to set up who these characters' personalities are like, uh, who the antagonists are and what they want. I mean, yeah, this is probably the manual, but still having some more of that in the game to give both the heroes and the villains a voice of some form or another would help. Battletoads did this, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, of course, did this. Um, it would give you something to give the sense of the, of the animated series that never was that this game would be uh, related to. Still, otherwise, like... I've noticed that Titus's platformers have been improving over time, at least as far as the gameplay and control is concerned. Indeed, one of the previous their previous titles I thought was like really solid and something I wanted to pick up. But this one isn't quite as good at conveying the narrative of the story as some of their earlier titles, and certainly their gameplay mechanics aren't as solid either. We have more strategies for Killer Instinct 2, including combo notes for various characters. Next up is the Super Nintendo version of the Smurfs. I tried to review the Game Boy version, but couldn't get it to work, so hopefully this version will fare better. In any case, we have maps of the first six areas of the game. Now, technically, this game did not actually come out in the US, it did come out in Europe, but due to the reduced number of games we have this issue, I'm just kind of grabbing this to pad the issue out. I admit upright. Now, the Smurfs is just a bad game. I certainly see why this did not come out in the US. Admittedly, maybe there's something with the controls I'm missing, maybe if I had the manual I'd be able to play it properly, but as the game gives you no obtensive verbs, not even jumping, it makes for a frustrating experience. This is all also paired with a bunch of like very lethal obstacles at the very start of the game when you have very little health. Also, like, all of these obstacles are caused by your fellow Smurfs. Like, you jump in water and you slip and take damage. Water puddles that are caused by Smurfs just constantly, like, tossing water out of their the doors of their Smurf houses as if they, like, all have a really bad leak, uh, leaky plumbing and need to bail their houses out. Um, like, 
Seriously, the AVGA and you probably get some serious mileage out of this game. In any case, uh, next up is Kirby's Block Ball, a Arkanoid clone, but with Kirby! We have notes on several of the early stages. So, um, that little quick description I gave when I was talking about the article part of it, yeah, that that's how this game is. It's it's Arkanoid, but oh, Kirby. I'm actually kind of bummed there isn't that much I can say about this game. I mean, it plays really well, although admittedly, I'd almost say it'd be better with a rotary controller instead of a D-pad, but they do make up for it by having several levels where you have paddles not just on the top and bottom of the screen, but also on the sides, and you control those using up and down instead of left and right, so it, it works well enough. There's a couple additional mechanics, like doing a uh, timed button press when Kirby's about to hit the paddle to switch from ball form to Kirby form, which will then do more damage and uh, to larger blocks and that sort of thing, but it's it's not quite as robust as I was expecting in terms of this game. Like, I was expecting a certain degree of, oh, um, you have a uh, sword enemy in this level and you hit them with Kirby and then they turn into um, a power-up, which will then impact how you hit blocks and that sort of thing, but not so much. Moving on, our cover story for this issue is an assortment of cheats for Earthworm Jim, Jim 2, including a bunch which are reprinted from earlier issues. Um, yeah, like, again, I've already reviewed this game, I give my thoughts on it, this is just, this isn't even like level-specific strategies, this is just cheats. I'm giving this a miss. In Epic Center news, we have Lufia 2 that is coming out. We're still getting more RPGs for the Super Nintendo. Awesome. Also, the coverage of Super Mario RPG continues with more maps and walkthroughs from the next chunk of areas of the game. We also have another import RPG in the Epic Center column, with uh, Tactics Ogre being the uh, import title this issue. This game has gotten a port for the PSP, which I would describe to be the best way to play the game if you have a PSP or can play it digitally on your Vita. It it has all the same great narrative, plus it does some great stuff in terms of, like, time, letting you rewind time in battles and, you know, um, leveling up classes as opposed to individual characters. So when you need to replace a character, they're, they're going to be auto-leveled up for the rest of your party, all that fun stuff. But yeah, uh, Tactics Ogre, great game. We have some more strategies for Civilization, this time focused on getting the Alpha Centauri victory condition. In classified information, we get an unlimited ammo code for MechWarrior 3050. Now, what we really need for this game is either an unlimited health code or a limited enemies code, since apparently the unlimited enemies cheat got accidentally enabled at the factory. We have a strategy guide for Pocahontas for the Game Boy, based on the somewhat problematic, um, though less so than certain earlier titles, Disney film from the Disney Renaissance. And this is the only version of this game to come out on Nintendo platform. Uh, this also came out for the Genesis, and there was a Super Nintendo version planned, but which didn't come out. Pocahontas, the Game Boy game, is really bad. The game is trying to do the slow, fluid, cinematic platformer movement thing, like your um, Prince of Persia's and your Nosferatu's and all that sort of thing. But on the Game Boy, it just comes across as being unresponsive with that delay, that significant delay between when you press the button and when you start moving. And this is all aggravated by the way the game handles its puzzles. I don't have a problem with the game, you see this game, being focused on puzzle solving over action. It fits with the themes of this film. Of the film. It feels much, much more about resolving problems through talking and other methods, um, and that the rush to violence is what causes the problems. I do have a problem, though, where if your focus is going to be on puzzle solving, you need to have a way to reset the puzzle, and if you don't, then that's no good. Indeed, the way to reset your like the opening puzzle in the game when you get stuck, and you will get stuck, is to reset the Game Boy. 
which means you have to go through like a, about like 30 seconds, like 25, 30 seconds ish. I may be exaggerating, but not by much, of in of various mandatory company title cards uh, before you actually get to start the, starting the game again. It makes for a really unpleasant mess to play. Give this title a miss. There have been so many much better um, Disney video games that it's actually kind of shocking to an extent. Though, next up is the port of College Slam for the Game Boy. I was already unimpressed with this game on the Super Nintendo, and I can't see any way for the portable version to fix the fundamental complaints that I had with that game, unless they have a different team layout that includes the missing teams from the Pac-10. But we're light for titles this issue, so... Well, the good news is, is College Slam plays like College Slam. The, the snozberries taste like snozberries. The bad news is, it has all the faults that College Slam had on the Super Nintendo. No Pacific Northwest teams, has all the normal NBA Jam rubber banding without the endearing factor of getting to of if you are, in my case, in Oregon, being able to play as any of the possible teams that you could be super rooting for. Same if you live in Washington State. So, the main value of this game is thus the two-player, which is all the more reason to play the Super Nintendo version, either on a physical cartridge with a roommate, or using an emulator in online play. We have a FAQ for Legend of Zelda Link to the Past. Like, in the traditional, these are the most frequently asked questions that the that we have received since. Uh, the game is, for, for way of explanation, the game is at this point getting a re-release. Um, and in honor of that, they're reprinting a whole bunch of all the most frequently asked questions that the, are directed to game counselors so that they're here and you can pick this, this issue Nintendo Power on this newsstands or order a back issue, and that way, when the N64 comes out, you know, the people who bought Mario 64 and are calling and trying to find out where to find certain stars and whether Yoshi's in the game and all sorts of other stuff, that, that those people get through and let them make their calls. In Counselor's Corner, we have a question about how to do animalities in Mortal Kombat 3, since animalities are the other big new thing there uh no also rans again in the now playing column again probably mainly because we're at the end of a console generation and the big titles are kind of slowing down because we're all waiting for the n64 to come out at least as far as nintendo power is concerned and in pack watch to wrap up the issue we have preview coverage of tetris attack and ultimate mortal kombat 3 my pick of the issue is Kirby's Block Ball, admittedly somewhat by default, since there's not a lot of competition this issue. That, that said, I do own a copy of the Super Famicom version of Tactics Ogre Let Us Cling Together, and I really should get around to playing that with the translation patch, maybe for a future Let's Play at some point. Um, pro probably once the Polymega comes, comes out. In any case, n next issue we have the results of the Nintendo Power Awards. They might not be calling them Nestor Awards anymore, but they're still the Nestor Awards in our hearts and on, and on our bow ties. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.